this is very important today. I hear that. I've seen uh, the, the one website has, you know, Satan loves you, you know, t-shirts. And Satan is your friend. And he's really out to help you. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I know, right? I mean, I'm always shopping for more satanic clothing myself. I just like the style. Must be all that heavy metal and Dungeons and Dragons I played back in the 80s. But I've never seen those shirts that you're talking about. And they don't make sense either, not all of them. So I suspect that at least some of those shirts are like Satan himself, in that you claim to have witnessed them, but they don't really exist. I just, I want to warn everyone very clearly, Satan is a vicious evil this hum, uh, 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 being. I suggest you read through your Bible again, because you've got Satan confused with Jehovah, the bloodthirsty totalitarian tyrant who ordered whole villages to be sacked and everyone murdered, except for the orphan preteen girls. If they were virgins, then God allowed his men to keep them as sex slaves for themselves. God does all manner of indefensible evil all through the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, too. I would make a video listing the evil things that God does, but that would just be the Bible. And the only evil Satan ever did in all of your sacred fables was whatever God forced him to do in the book of Job. Which is funny, because... God was then the first one to use the excuse that the devil made me do it, because the godly love to project their own faults onto the innocent and pretend as if they're not the only ones doing the very thing that they accuse others of doing. Uh, there is nothing good about Satan, and he only wills your destruction. Well, as a symbol, Satan can represent, and for many people he does represent, reason as the adversary or opposer of faith. Faith being entirely dishonest and auto-deceptive, an unreasonable assertion assumed without reason and defended against all reason, refusing to change your mind when you're wrong. And personally, I think that any belief that requires faith should be rejected for that reason. And that's why Satan tried to reason with Jesus, who was then holding to an irrational belief. And what Satan said in that story is not the way a reasonable person would argue, but then that story wasn't written by reasonable people, was it? It was made up by believers as propaganda to promote faith. So it's just as unrealistic a misrepresentation as religious apologetics arguments always are. And this illustrates why, if we would seek truth sincerely and without blinding biases, we must first reject faith. That's why Satan remained honest throughout the Bible where God lied over and over again. I should make a video about that soon, listing some of the times that God lied in the Bible. So don't blame Satan for what God does in your compilation of favorite folklore. Instead, remember what it says in Isaiah 45, that your God is the one who is solely responsible for all the evil, darkness, death, and destruction in the world. And he can only give you, by the way, what he has. What does he have? Uh, evil, hatred, violence, chaos. That contradicts your own dogma, creating an unrealistic character that doesn't have any intelligible motivation which only makes sense when you realize that God doesn't have any intelligible motivation either, and that there is only madness to his methods. They blame the mythical Satan for violence and chaos because they're selling Christian control as a false promise of orderly peace. You call Satan evil and the Lord of lies, but the lie is that he exists at all. Abrahamic religion is the real evil and the all-time champion of false promises and exaggerated claims. Can he give you happiness? No, he can't. He doesn't have any. Can he give you joy? Absolutely not. He'll make your life miserable and he'll destroy you. Again, that doesn't sound like Satan, but Jehovah, the capricious maniac whose frequent fits of inexplicable insecurity resulted in genocide after genocide. So God will destroy you, both in this world and the next, with his empty threat of a fate worse than death for all eternity which is the ultimate injustice and the worst evil imaginable. Not even as punishment for something bad either, but merely for the most petty of reasons, over a thought crime that shouldn't be a crime at all. The crime that you were not credulous enough to believe impossible nonsense told to you by an obvious liar. <laughs> God will punish you for that, something he should praise you for. And he would praise you if he was a just God, but he's not. The Bible and the Quran both describe God as an indomitable despot, ready to torture everyone forever over any trivial excuse, while Satan reportedly argued for the salvation of everyone, not just the believers. And he's a complete narcissist. The only uh, individual he cares about is himself. 
You think the biblical character of Satan is the narcissist, not Jehovah? Jehovah is up there with Donald Trump and Kent Hovind as the perfect example of a malignant narcissist, exhibiting every symptom of that condition. Look at your Ten Commandments, or at least the most popular two of the three contradictory sets of commandments according to the Christians, the ones in Exodus 20. The first four of them have nothing to do with human law, nothing whatsoever with how we should govern ourselves. Instead, they're all about glorifying God, the ultimate narcissist of all time. Now look at the seven tenets of the Satanic Temple, each of which are better than your whole Decalogue, because these give a framework that is legitimately moral. And not a word of it glorifies Satan, because he's not real. And if he was real, if gods were real, then they wouldn't be as vain, or jealous, or vengeful, or wroth, as your God admits to being. That's four of the seven deadly sins, and they're all symptoms of narcissism, and he's bragging about them. How narcissistic is that? No being worthy of worship would ever want to be worshipped. Why would any actual deity need or want whatever little glory we could give them? That's more to comfort the clergy who are trying to assume power over the masses based on a transparent scam that they don't want anyone to see through. God is narcissistic because the clergy that invented him is narcissistic. I say that sometimes to demons. Wait, what you say to demons? You talk to demons, like they're real. Do you also have conversations with leprechauns or garden gnomes? Can you read minds as well? Do you hear voices whispering things to you even after you turn off the TV? Otherwise, you know, like everyone else, I too have played in the land of make-believe in my youth. But at some point, you have to distinguish fact from fantasy, accept reality, and discard delusion. Those people you claim to exercise are not possessed by demons, and your make-believe witchcraft is not helping them. There are no demons. This eternal conflict of impossibly pure good against alleged evil of gods and devils, Thor and Loki, yin and yang, is just folklore among the oldest of all the story tropes. And the moral, if we may call it that collectively, is immoral because it is told for the purpose of forcing conformity, to impose blind obedience upon the listeners, because authoritarian rulers don't want their subordinates to act with independent rational agency. This is the rebellious opposition that Satan represents. That character is but a symbol, like Uncle Sam was back in World War II. Was it ever true that Uncle Sam wants you? No. Uncle Sam doesn't exist, except as an idea. He represented the United States, the country we live in. But more than that, back then, Uncle Sam represented the country we want to live in, the one we wish it was. That idea is what needs you to support, promote, and defend it. It's the same today, when the greatest threat our secular nation faces comes from within, from religious right conservative Christian nationalists who are surprisingly similar to the enemy we fought back in Uncle Sam's day. Satan represents the unbelievers in the plight of reason over madness, and Christianity is all about manipulating the masses with madness. Your exorcisms are an example of religious madness. I'll command you in Jesus' name. Do, do, does Satan love you? And they'll go, tell me the truth in Jesus' name. No. I said, but does Jesus still love you? Yes. They say that because you're talking to severely confused and traumatized Christians. They were groomed to believe that way since they were toddlers, and they've been so heavily conditioned so deeply that by adulthood, they would even believe that a good person could torture those whom he supposedly loves. Believers don't even see the contradiction there because of the insidious programming the church always employs. Their very capacity for critical thinking has been disabled. They don't even understand what they're going through. They can't analyze it properly or sanely. So they're unwittingly just acting as if they're demons because all they know is that that's what's expected of them in that situation. They may not even think that it's them doing it. Some religious services are a lot like, if you've ever seen one of those hypnotists perform in a nightclub, Hypnosis is just like a magical enchantment, such as a blessing or a curse or possession. They're all imaginary. To believe in any of it, you have to play along, to make believe. That's what it means to have faith. That's why people fall over when the faith healer uses his Jedi magic. It's literally a mind trick. And whether you're dancing around with venomous snakes or speaking in tongues, it's all pretend. 
which is why people who had faith enough to take up the serpents will still die if they get bit by them, because the Bible is wrong, and there's only so much that positive thinking can do against a cold, hard reality that doesn't care what you believe. And the same thing goes for people whom you think are possessed. Whether they know it or not, whether they agree or not, they're playing into the exorcist's fantasy, if not their own as well. Because people are often irrational, reactionary, easily manipulated, self-deluded, emotionally motivated fools. They will play along with the exorcist game, even if they don't want to, simply as a condition of inculcated belief. So it's no surprise at all that they would say these things in a situation of desperate mental stress. And I suspect that with your education, you must already understand that. You know, people ask me how I got into the ministry. I'm a licensed psychologist, and uh, about 15 years ago, the diocese had a potential case so they asked me to evaluate the person and see if the person had a psychological problem or maybe they needed an exorcism. If you ever come to the conclusion that someone needs an exorcism, then you're the one with the psychological problem. I did the evaluation. Uh, she seemed to be psychologically sound, so I said to the archdiocese, you know, this woman should really be seen by an exorcist. At which point you should have been dismissed and never called upon again. If she didn't need psychiatric help, then maybe you do. They didn't have one. So they asked three different priests to do it, and they all said no. Very wise. Although, if I were one of those priests, and assuming that I could guess what you would do next, I would have whispered to the patient to just play along. I'll spritz some water at you. We'll pretend it's holy. and You pretend to be in agony for a moment, and then miraculously recover. We'll have you out of here in five minutes, and then we can talk about options for legitimate therapy that might actually be helpful. So I'm sitting there with the auxiliary bishop saying, well, what do we do now? I would have suggested that for your patient's sake and for the common good, that you chill out, go home, and take a couple of gummy edibles. Have five of them. Then we'll see you in a couple of days when you get back from your trip. I said, well, you know, I said, well, just give it to me. I said, how hard can it be? <laughs> so that was dumb. Yeah, that was dumb, and it still is. Performing an exorcism is just as easy as playing cops and robbers, and just like with any children's game, there's a lot of unnecessary yelling and screaming, acting out and carrying on. It's dangerous, too. People have died from the torture performed in exorcisms. But nonetheless, uh, that's how I started, and uh, no one else would do it. No one should do it. It's insane. I'll tell you, I'm the same age as the actress who played the little girl in that movie about exorcists. That film came out when I was 12 and she was 12, and I snuck into a lot of age-restricted films as a kid, and I saw that one a couple of times just because I thought she was cute. I've seen Linda Blair in a few things since then, too, as we both grew up, because I always thought she was cute. But in that movie, I remember there were boring parts and there were funny parts. There wasn't anything scary about that film, except, you know, the way Hollywood is with child actors. So if you're going to pretend to cast demons out of a child, then I strongly recommend that we have a chaperone there to make sure that the priest keeps his crucifix to himself. If the diocese can't find someone to sit in on something like that because, you know, everybody they have is too frightened of evil spirits, then ask an atheist, someone who couldn't get scared by this nonsense anyway. I'll do it. It'll be fun. Well, for me, I guess having your fraud exposed on YouTube wouldn't be much fun for you. Exorcist will all tell you that when the Blessed Mother, the Mother of Jesus, shows up, the demons can't get out of the room fast enough. I mean, they just beat feet out of there. Wow. I suggested that you have some edibles earlier, but that obviously won't do because whatever you're already on is much stronger. How do you know when Madonna shows up? I mean, how do you know when the Virgin Mary shows up? How do you know when she's there? How do you know when the demons run? How do you know that they are running? I mean, do you see it with your own eyes, or is all of that determined by rolling 16 or better on a pair of 10-sided dice? They can't stand being in their presence. Have you talked with any other licensed psychologists about this? Outside of your diocese, I mean, a secular psychologist. I think they might be very interested in talking with you. I bet psychiatrists would be, too. Because this reminds me of when an old friend many years ago told me that he worships the Egyptian cat-headed goddess Bast because, he said, she appeared to him visibly in his house. She embraced him physically and spoke to him audibly, asking him to become her disciple, which, not surprisingly, he did. And back then in my credulous youth, I might have done the same. 
But once you're able to see through the mentally erected smoke and mirrors, such beings no longer appear. Or if they do, you can see right through them, not just literally, but figuratively too. So that even if you do see something like that, you still at least have enough presence of mind to recognize a hallucination. And you probably wouldn't want to take too seriously whatever it's telling you to do. How is it? What is this power that, that you has? Much like Dumbo's magic feather, the only power your mythic Madonna has is whatever you give to her. Let me sit down in a few of your exorcisms and I'll show you how little power she has then. Because actually the exorcist will say, it's been our experience, that she doesn't actually say anything. When Mary shows up, she doesn't say a thing. They just run. Why? Why is that? Because she's not really there, and neither are your demons. I was a neo-pagan spiritualist once upon a time, and I've had similar experiences with seemingly demonic apparitions myself. I was also reborn in Christ at one time, and both of these experiences showed me how auto-deceptive faith can be, and how the right ambiance, cues, and conditions can prompt one to see and feel things that aren't really there and isn't really happening. Oh, but it seems like it in the moment, doesn't it? I know. Been there. Done that. I don't like to talk about that anymore because it's embarrassing to me to admit now how credulous I was back then when I used to say things like you are still saying now. Exorcism, like any other occult practice, is a complex fantasy that you and your priestly playmates have invented for yourselves. Other religions do something similar, but of course with different deities and demigods following entirely different rituals and mythos, but with the same results. Their experiences are just as real, meaning they're just as fake, just as deceptive and illusion as what you experience yourself. I know firsthand because I've been there too. Because she's a vessel for God and Jesus. She carried Jesus in her womb. She carries Jesus in her, in her heart. She is the, the, the first and best of disciples. So the power of Christ flows through her. Not on my watch. Have me sit in on some of these sessions and you'll see. I have this effect on gods and ghosts and other such things. It's like when you take your car to the mechanic and it doesn't make that noise when he's listening. That's how it'll be with Mary and me. She won't even show up if I'm there. What do you want to bet? And there won't be any demons there either, meaning that you will be the most evil being in the room with us. In the end, it's, all, it's Jesus. Jesus, the God-man who destroyed Satan's kingdom on the cross. As I understand it, one of the Norse gods tried to stop him, but, you know, he had that miraculous gauntlet. It is Jesus who casts out Satan. Ah, yes, I think I remember this story. Let's see, the, it, there was a girl who wasn't, wasn't, she wasn't, she wasn't supposed to talk with the big bad wolf, but uh, he was disguised as an old witch who gave her a cursed apple. And they don't tell you this in the story. You're just supposed to know the secret that the talking wolf was secretly the wicked queen in disguise. And so the maiden bit into the apple and fell. And then the woodsman drove Hansel and Gretel away from Never Never Land. Yep, something like that anyway. Of course, really, in the original Jewish story, Satan was never cast out of heaven. That was another misunderstood, wrong interpretation. Isaiah wasn't referring to the devil. That character hadn't been invented yet. Isaiah was talking about the planet Venus, the morning star, light bringer, sun of the dawn, that always diminishes as the sun rises. Now, the part of the sun was being played by the Mesopotamian father god El. As I understood it, Isaiah was criticizing Babylonian astrology. And Christians simply misread that while trying to squeeze their devil into elder mythology that didn't already have such a character in it. The Jews only had Satan, not your devil. So the Christians reach back beyond Judaism to one of the major influences behind Judaism to appropriate the old Zoroastrian deity Araman the Opposer, Ha Shatan, and they incorporated that with the Semitic Satan to make your devil. And the Satan can't stand anything holy. Hold up a crucifix, a hold, throw some holy water on the person, whatever. You know, in a lot of the newer movies, that doesn't work anymore. You should try garlic instead. Oh, and silver bullets. If you can't afford that, you can also use silver nitrate, put it in a spray bottle, makes them explode. I hear you can also kill them with dragon glass. The demons start screaming. No, there are no demons. Those are people who are screaming, the ones you're scaring and scarring with your psychotic theatrics, because you've made them believe this vacuous insanity so deeply that they have no defense, neither against your pseudoscientific woo nor your training as a psychologist, both of which combine to create in your victims the illusion of a powerful cleric. But when the Blessed Mother shows up, the presence of Christ in her is the strongest. She is the first, holiest 
and best of disciples. And so this radiant presence of Christ flows through our Blessed Mother in a way which is quite unique. We love our, the Virgin Mother, all exorcists do. That reminds me of so many other young women who were supposedly virgins, even when we knew that a whole bunch of other guys already loved her. But of course, Mary wasn't a virgin. That was a mistranslation and yet another wrong interpretation of Isaiah 7 that found its way into the gospel erroneously attributed to Matthew. Isaiah was talking about a maiden who was not only not a virgin, she was already pregnant or thought to be pregnant, with an unremarkable child who was to have lived and died some 700 years before the time assumed for your Jesus in an entirely unrelated prophecy which also failed spectacularly. And of course, we, we all should love the Blessed Mother. She's beautiful, she's wonderful. That's just one of the things that happens to a man when you make him take a vow of lifelong chastity. Since you're not allowed porn either, I bet you get excited if you get your hands on a Sears catalog. Or, you know, since you're a Catholic priest, maybe you prefer reading Fun with Dick and Jane. Demons can't read our minds. They can't see the future. So the mind of a demon isn't capable of anything that a human mind isn't capable of. So it could actually just be a human mind in there. Makes sense, since you're talking to people not demons. And that's why your God can't read your mind or see the future either, because he's also existing only in your imagination. That's why Jesus supposedly said that he would return very soon, so soon that some, though not all, of his apostles in that first century generation would still be alive to see him coming in the clouds at the right hand of power. But they're all dead now. That whole generation is gone. And Jesus is a couple thousand years late, so he obviously couldn't see the future either. But, but, they're, they have intellectually, they're very bright. Yeah, they have human intelligence because they're human, not demons. They're just poor, frightened people who have been rendered defenseless against the constant stream of lies that the church has been feeding them all their lives and which you use to your advantage. I mean, they're stupid because they have no wisdom, but they're intellectually very bright. They're like a supercomputer. What must it be like? to be intellectual, capable of complex mathematics and all of that, yet have no wisdom. Would that be like being able to exist in the world well enough to go to school and to work and to keep the bills paid, but at the same time be so foolish that you would readily believe anything, even stories about magic spells and evil spirits and animals that talk and act like people? They uh, can see what's going on and can guess what you're thinking very accurately. They can guess what, what the future might be given all the factors they see just like people do, huh? And since you know so much about this sort of thing, let me ask, who would win in a fight, a vampire or a werewolf? So don't see the future unless God allows it. God is fickle that way, isn't he? Sometimes he allows even his worst enemies to see into the future, just like sometimes he turns his back on his own people and hardens Pharaoh's heart just to drag the story out so that more people die. But he doesn't kill the demons, does he? God's enemies get special powers. God's friends pay 10% of their income. And everybody else, including every fawn and every innocent mouse in, in South America, every koala in Australia, they all get to drown for all God cares. <laughs> what a God. Don't uh, uh, read your minds, but are very intuitive, very smart, and can, can uh, kind of project what, what might happen. I can predict what will happen, too, just as well as you can. I think we both already know that if you let me sit in and observe a few of these exorcisms, there won't be anything to see. It'll be just like watching every episode of Ghost Hunter, where they still never found anything, even after 13 seasons. Yet, I can already sense the presence of an irrational evil, a father of lies who's trying to convince another person that they're possessed by the ghost of an imaginary monster. You know as well as I do that demons will not appear unless we make believe hard enough. And I ain't no pretender.
If you ever come to the conclusion that someone needs an exorcism, then you're the one with the psychological problem.